Well, good morning. <laughs> sure is glad to see everybody out this morning and just a great day to uh, worship our Lord and fellowship with one another. Um, if you're visiting with us today, we're welcome. Do I have an echo? <laughs> we'll, work, we'll get to it. Um, I'm Brooke and I'm one of the elders and just again, great to have you all here. Um, you'll see in the bulletins a couple of things just to make you aware of the children ministry that uh, Pastor Greg mentioned last week. Uh, looking for helpers there. Vacation Bible School coming up in uh, August. Do I need to put my hand over this mic? <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's something to be praying for and looking forward to if that's something you can help with. And then we have a newcomer's meet and greet uh, starting soon. So uh, if you're new, relatively new, want to get to know a few more folks around, we encourage you to do that. Uh, then on the bottom, you'll see the support for the Mexico team. Uh, they made it. Uh, if you get a chance to read the blog, there's the information there in the bulletin. They made it down to San Diego yesterday. Uh, Pastor Greg updated the blog this morning talking about uh, hard floors and early mornings because they are staying at Pastor Dustin's church last night. They are anticipating crossing the border about noon today, so ask that we keep that in prayer, that all would go well. So just, uh, if you get a chance, uh, take a look at the blog. I think they're gonna update it as often as they can and give us, uh, give us what's going on at the moment of the Mexico trip, so. Uh, I think that's all the announcements for this morning, so let's uh, turn to God's word for our call to worship this morning. And it's from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the un uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that we have been bought by your blood and we have been brought near to you. Let us be drawn even closer to you this morning by the Holy Spirit as we worship you in song and the teaching of your word, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. Let's stand and worship. Oh, church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our Reaching out to those in darkness. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor, and with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and might.
scripture reading for today is Zechariah 14, verses 1 through 9. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out in exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountain shall reach to Azel, and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. On that day there shall be no light, cold, or frost, and there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time there shall be light. On that day, living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, and we pray. by our love we will walk with each other we will walk hand in hand we will walk with each other we will walk hand in hand and together we'll spread the news that God is in our land and they'll know again, please. God, we praise you today for your invisible attributes, for your eternal power and divine nature, which have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in these things that have been made. We are without excuse. The heavens declare your glory and the sky above proclaims your handiwork. Lord Jesus, you made the world, yet the world did not know you. You are the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and you uphold the universe by the word of your power. After making purification for sins, you sat down at the right hand of the majesty of on high. Truly, you are the God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. Lord, we pray today that we will trust you more, praise you more, and glorify you more as we worship you in spirit and in truth. 
We also pray for our mission team who is left to serve you and serve other believers in Tijuana, Mexico. We especially pray for Lisa Chapman this morning as she hurt her back prior to leaving and is, is feeling the effects. We would just pray that you would touch her, heal her body, and help her be a productive member, however you choose to use her during this upcoming week. We pray that your gospel will advance in the hearts and lives of our Mexico team, no matter what earthly circumstances they face. May their ministry not be marked by envy, rivalry, or selfish ambition, but by a pure love for you, for one another, and for those who don't know you yet. May you be honored in their lives this week, in their physical bodies, in their thinking, in their emotions, and in their hearts. We are reminded of scripture which says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him in whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Thank you for opportunities for them and for us to be preachers of your gospel. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Church of Christ in sorrow now, where evil lies in wait. When trials and persecutions come, this light will never fade. For though the hordes of hell may rage, their power will not endure. Our times are in the Father's hands. Our of Christ upon that day when all are gathered in when every tear is wiped away with every trace of sin where justice, truth and beauty shine and death has passed away when God and man will dwell as one for Thank you, praise team, for leading us before the throne. Good morning, family. Great to be with you again. A blessed Sunday morning to you. 
You know, when the uh, shepherds are away, the sheep will play, right? (laughs) We're going to have a great time in the book of Ephesians this morning. Praise God. Um, May 23rd, about seven weeks ago, my beloved bride, Holly, who's hiding over there, uh, slipped and fell while mowing a particularly steep slope part of our lawn. And as you probably know, she severely fractured uh, her ankle, actually in several places. The, the x-ray showed and then and, uh, uh, surgery a few days later began the healing process, but it, it's going to take months and a lot of work for her to walk normally again. Well, as a a sort of a pastor to pastors, I hear from church leaders in the U.S. and all around the world about challenges that they face in their churches. One issue that I hear about frequently is about divisions in their churches. They tell me shepherding the fractured flock of God has never been more difficult. You know, in some ways, we in the body of Christ, you can kind of think of us as perhaps having fallen on a slippery slope over the past maybe 18 months, say, and many churches today are experiencing severe fracturing, desperately in need of healing. Now, this is not a new problem, okay? Let's be straight. It's not a new problem. The New Testament is filled with passages that address issues related to unity. In fact, each of the churches that the Apostle Paul wrote to struggled in one way or another with unity. Why is this the case? Well, it's because we are messed up, broken, sinful people. And when you put a group of us together, friends, problems are bound to happen. It's inevitable. But if we follow biblical instruction, our beauty in the body of Christ will far outweigh our brokenness. In fact, in uh, Psalm 133, the psalmist tells us that it is good and pleasant when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. The psalmist says that it unleashes blessings in our church family, in the global body of Christ, including, he says, life forevermore. Well, Ephesians 4 is our passage that we'll be focused on. I invite you to open there in your Bibles, Ephesians 4. And uh, we're going to see that Paul gives us some strong words aimed at growing, growing unity in the body of Christ. Our main point this morning, God calls us, you and me, to walk with each other in loving unity based on the unity of God and God's design for the church. Now, this week, we'll be focused on the first six verses of Ephesians 4, and we'll see God's design for unity in the church. God's design for unity in the church. Next week, you're stuck with me again, and we're going to continue on in Ephesians 4, verses 7 through 16, and see God's design for diversity in the church. God's designed for unity today. Next week, God's designed for diversity in the church. So please follow along, either behind me or in your own Bibles, ESV, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I therefore, Paul says, a prisoner of the Lord, for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul says, verse 4, there is one body, 
and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Let's pray together. Father, as we continue our morning together worshiping you, we pray that you will send your spirit, Lord, unify us as a local church and as the global church of Jesus Christ. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to receive your message for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The context of our passage, friends, um, in Ephesians 4, Paul does what he does in, in a number of his other books. He starts with a, 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 a foundation of theology, theological underpinnings that uh, some groundwork that he lays in the first three chapters of Ephesians and then he goes in the next four uh, three chapters chapters four five and six he goes into the practical application that flows out of that theological groundwork we could see in one of the first words of chapter four therefore that ties us back that these sections are linked together and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the context very soon but uh, And in fact, you can follow along in your, your bulletin. You see point one there on the back, back side of your bulletin. Jot down some, some thoughts, some application points. I encourage you to do that. First of all, we see our calling to loving unity. Our calling to loving unity. Verses one through three. Paul says he addresses himself as a prisoner for the Lord. He has done so likewise in chapter 3, verse 1. He's a prisoner for the sake of the gospel. He's in prison writing this letter uh, to the Ephesian church as a prisoner for the Lord, in service to the Lord. And he says there, I urge you, I urge you. This word for urge is a strong ex exhortation. It's a, it's a pleading. It's, it's not just a gentle suggestion. If it happens to work well for you and fit into your scheme, then go ahead and do this. No, it's, it, it's, I get the picture of, of a rambunctious five-year-old boy, a son who is wandering dangerously close to the edge of a cliff, and the, the parent he doesn't say, oh, you know, Johnny, if, if you feel like it, maybe step back a little ways. No, there's an urgency. There's a pleading to get back from the edge. And this urgency, this pleading, he, Paul says he urges you. That's the Ephesian church. That's you and me today, God's Spirit speaking to us, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. He's talking about our daily conduct. He's talking about how our lifestyle needs to match our calling. It's the primary command of our passage. Make sure that you are walking in a way that matches your calling. So we have to ask, what is the Ephesians calling? What is our calling and ultimately, I'd say it's life in Christ. Life in Christ. And, and uh, we can get that. Actually, if you turn uh, in your Bibles back just a page, and we're just going to kind of scream through the first three chapters real briefly. And you can just follow along as I'm drawing out various points about our calling in Jesus Christ, our life in Christ. Paul starts off in Ephesians 1 by talking about our, our spiritual blessings in Christ. And you know this section, verses 3 down through verse 14. We've been called and chosen to be holy, blameless, predestined, adopted, he says, redeemed, forgiven, heirs with Jesus Christ, living to the praise of God's glory. We've been sealed with the Spirit, and verse 18, knowing the hope to which we are called. All part of our calling. We continue on with chapter 2, and we see that part of our calling is that we've been uh, made alive with Jesus Christ. 
by God's mercy, he says in verse 5. We've been raised up and seated in the heavenly places. We've been saved by grace through faith. Amen? Amen? That's part of our calling, and we are created for good works, verse 10 says. Although previously, Paul says we were far off, Gentiles were far off in, in Christ, we've been brought near, verses 12 and 13. And, and there's the dividing wall, he says, of hostility between Jews and Gentiles, between any particular groups, is broken down by Christ, who is our peace. Verses 14 to 18. That's part of our calling. Now we are fellow citizens with the saints, members of God's household, God's dwelling by the work of the Spirit. We are built upon God's dwelling. That's us. We are built upon the Word of God, he says, with Jesus Christ as our cornerstone. Verses 19 to 22. So continuing on with our calling. This is all part of our calling. Okay, who we are called to be living in Christ. Chapter 3 continues that Gentiles, along with Jews, are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise of the gospel in Jesus Christ. Those first six verses of chapter 3. Through the church, the wisdom of God... The Lord says, will we'll be manifest on earth as it is in heaven. We are the dwelling of Christ, verse 17 says, comprehending the surpassing love of Christ, filled with the fullness of God, verses 18 and 19. This is our calling, brothers and sisters, and Paul ends that section, verses 20 and 21, by saying, praise God. Praise God for this amazing calling that we have in Christ. Now that we understand our calling and the need to walk, the urgency to walk in a manner worthy of this calling, we have to say, what does it look like for us to walk in a manner worthy of this calling? And, and Paul gives us several descriptions of what this looks like. You see this starting in verse 2. He says, walk with all humility and gentleness and patience. Humility, gentleness, and patience. All words that are closely linked together, all of which I'm pretty lousy at. But Christ was not lousy at, okay? Humility. It's a, a, a humility was a, a very foreign concept to the church when Paul was writing to Ephesus. Um, it has the idea of putting others before yourself. You know what humility is. Realizing that we are no better than anyone else. It's the idea that Paul draws out in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Humility flows into gentleness, that second quality that he describes. Gentleness is, is strength under control. It's not weakness. It's the old term meekness. It's, it's strength under control. It's choosing to kindly treat others with a soft hand instead of harshly. You know, I think about Matthew 11 and uh, the, the kingdom of God forcefully advances and forceful men take hold of it. Man, I'm all into that, that force stuff. Yeah? Hmm. Paul says... Tame that back, Eric. Come on. Just pull it back. Humble, gentle, and that flows into our third element, patience. Literally, this means long-tempered, not short-tempered, long-tempered. And it's, again, a fruit of the, of the Spirit, along with gentleness, that flows from those other two. 
We better keep going. Uh, moving along, he says the next quality, bearing with one another in love. You see that at the end of verse 2? Bearing with one another in love. Has the idea of enduring patiently, enduring lovingly through sufferings, through challenges. That includes when other people are at fault. You bear with them in love. You're patient and gentle and humble. You bear with them. That's why this love that he's talking about, bearing with one another in love, it needs to be unconditional love. Unconditional love. It doesn't take, take into account wrongs suffered. You know, you get a group of people together and there are inevitably going to be differences. There's going to be disagreements. But in love, we can be patient. We can be humble with one another, gentle, quick to forgive, quick quick to love. We can, we can appreciate each other. We can, we can listen to one another. We can bear with one another. Instead of reacting, instead of escaping, we can stay engaged and love, bearing with one another. And then the last that he talks about in verse 3 there is to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Eager to maintain unity. It's sort of, you get the picture of, we're chomping at the bit, not for my way to be done, but instead, I'm chomping at the bit for harmony, for unity, for putting others before myself. I'm not pushing for my own way. Unity of the Spirit is really unity that comes from the Spirit. As we draw closer to the Spirit, that unity is going to be an inevitable byproduct. This bond of peace that he talks about it, is it, has the idea that peace instead of conflict is what characterizes our fellowship together it characterizes our relationships peace is what binds us together in loving unity you know another way of saying these the, the verses two and three there is that we eagerly strive for peaceful unity through graciously dealing with each other in love it's a, a, a common sentiment that paul talks about again and again in colossians 3 li listen to this colossians 3 verses 12 to 14 i want you to just pay attention to the parallels between what he says to the church in Colossae and, and the church in ephesus put on then as god's chosen ones as god's chosen ones that's our calling god's chosen ones holy and beloved compassionate hearts kindness humility meekness and patience Ooh, that times it's, it's, it's five i get five strikes Ugh. five areas C compassion hearts kindness humility meekness patience bearing with one another and if one has a complaint against e each other if one has a complaint against another forgiving each other as the lord has forgiven you so you also must forgive he says and above all these put on guess love Yep. Above everything, put on love because he says it binds everything together in perfect harmony. You see the similarity with our passage that we're looking at in Ephesians 4? Probably so far, my guess is nothing new. Okay, everyone's like, yep, yep, we've heard that before. We know unity is important. But the issue, friends, is uh, what do we need to sacrifice in order to gain that unity that Paul urges us to pursue. At times in my own life, I know that I need to deny myself in favor of others. I need to crucify my own pride. I need to release my rights in favor of giving preference to others. It's the idea that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 12. 
Romans chapter 12, verses 16 and 18, live in harmony with one another, he says. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. He says, verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends upon you, sometimes it's beyond us, but as far as you can do, live peaceably with all. Yeah, that was the Roman church. That was the Colossian, Colossian church. That was the Ephesian church. That is the Corinthian church also. The Corinthian church, chapter 1, verse 10 of 1 Corinthians. Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. You see, the Corinthian church had the same problem that many churches today have. Many divisions, people following different teachings. Oh, I follow this person. I follow this person. You can fill in names. You know, you're thinking of names right now. I know it. And, and you follow, this other person follows this and, and all this. And, and Paul says, is Christ divided? Come on, guys. Natural distinctions between us in the body must give way to prevailing unity in Christ. You know, I was thinking of a, of a way to illustrate this, and, um, and I always like biblical illustrations, and there's, there's one that uh, many can relate to. It stretches all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. It's a picture of marriage. Uh, Genesis 2 verse 24 uh, God says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, stretching forward all the way to the book of Matthew, chapter 19, Jesus affirms the same thing, quoting again that same Genesis 2 passage. And then Paul, in Ephesians 5, just the chapter after the one that we're looking at, states that marriage is actually a picture, an illustration of what? Of Christ and his church. Of Christ and the church. And he again quotes that Genesis 2 passage. God has bound us to each other and to Jesus Christ. So, we're going to graphically demonstrate this. I want everyone to take out your hands. You got your hands hopefully handy. <laughs> Get it? Um, and, and, uh, and, and hold up a triangle. Everyone can make a triangle with your fingers, okay? Everyone's got... Good, I see some good triangles there. All right? Excellent. Doing a great job. Very simple. But... The, the point is, you'll notice that along that triangle, now I have a hard time pointing when I'm doing this, but, but as, the, as you move up the edges of the triangle, you move toward the top, and what happens to those points along the edge? They get closer together. Do you see that? As you move up toward the top, you get closer together. So in marriage, as we move toward Christ, who is our head, we get closer, husband and wife get closer together, okay? I know it's simple, but it works for my mind, okay? We get closer together as we move toward Christ. In the body of Christ, we get closer together, okay? You, you still got the triangle thing, right? Okay. <laughs> we get closer together... As we move toward our head, Jesus Christ. Do you see the point? We move closer to each other by growing toward Christ. So, how are we doing? You can test your, your, uh, how you're doing on the unity scale, the unity meter, by, uh, by doing... Actually, I, I've heard that a number of people do this. In our church, we take, you take your uh, church directory... Okay, and, and, and a number of people pray through each person, person by person, as you're going through the church directory. And as you're going through and praying for this person, praying for the next person, praying for the next person, and then you come across someone, you're like, ooh, do I have to pray for that person? Okay, that, that's a sign that there's a growth opportunity for more unity with that person that you have a tough time praying for. Friends, the point is that God calls us to walk with each other in loving unity based on 
the unity of God and his design for the church, which is where we're moving with our second point there, our basis for loving unity. Verses four through six, our basis for loving unity. Paul emphasizes that God's design for loving unity, he, 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 uh, he actually uses seven different ones. Okay, track with me this. Seven times we see one come up, and we can think of two general categories. Two general categories. Thank you, Andrea, for making that. Um, so we, we've got unity in the church, one body, one hope, one faith, one baptism. And we've got unity in the Trinity, one Spirit, one Lord, one God, and Father of all. Get the idea that he's emphasizing one, one, one again and again. So let's, let's unpack this a little bit. How is it possible for us to grow in this loving unity? Well, Paul commands, can command us as believers to be united because in Christ we are united. It, it's not something that, oh, I hope one day you'll get there. He says, it is the case. We don't create our unity. We live it out. In Christ, we are part of the family of God. We are, in Jesus Christ, we are brothers and sisters. Amen? Amen. Now, friends, we need to live like it. We need to live like it. And so he says, verse 4, there is... Again, it's a statement of fact. There is, followed by seven ones, one body, he says. This is Paul's favorite, his, his most frequently used illustration of the church as a body, as a body. And, and I'm going to refer to a little bit back to Ephesians chapter 2 because he emphasizes this unity theme in the body in, in uh, 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 the last part of chapter 2 there a number of times. Chapter 2, verse 16, that both, he says both Jews and Gentiles are reconciled to God in one body through the cross. Verse 16 says, in, in fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul talks about communion. You guys took communion last week, right? Is that right? Yep. I, sorry, I had to be up in Vashon Island. They asked me to preach up there. So we took communion up there. But, uh, but the idea of communion, he, in chapter 10, he talks about one loaf, one, one body focused on remembering the death of Jesus Christ that binds us all together. We are one body. Not only that, we're one spirit. We're, uh, uh, we have one spirit. We aren't one spirit. We have one spirit. We serve one spirit. The church is one spirit, the Holy Spirit, that calls her, that regenerates her, that grows her, that empowers her, that, that unifies us together, that mobilizes us. One of my favorite passages, Trinitarian passage, is, is uh, again, chapter 2, verse 18. Through him, in the context that's through Jesus Christ, we both, Jews and Gentiles, that includes everyone, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Actually, it all three members are represented there of the Trinity with their offices, what they do. Through Jesus Christ, we have access in one spirit, living in one spirit to the Father. One spirit. We're also called, Paul says, to one hope. One singular hope. Our hope is not in ourselves it's not in our works it's not in any person or anything ultimately we hope what is that one hope our hope is an eternal relationship with god found only singularly entirely in jesus christ paul makes this so clear through his letter paul shares that the mystery of the gospel is now revealed to Gentiles, he says in Colossians 1, verse 27, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's our hope, Christ in us. 
Just over a week ago, we had uh, Terry Whitlock's memorial service, and at that time, uh, Greg shared one of Terry's favorite verses, was Lamentations chapter 3, verse 24. Lamentations 3, verse 24, the Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. He is our hope, friends. We have one hope to which we've been called. And, and not only that, but Paul goes on and he says there is one Lord. This is the Lord Jesus Christ that he's referring to, master over everything. He, he alone reigns in our hearts as Lord. He is, Colossians 1, Paul says, he is preeminent, supreme over all creation and over the church. He is over everything. He is one Lord. The verse that Virginia read for us uh, this morning, Zechariah 14, that last verse, verse 9, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. We serve one Lord Jesus Christ. And that, actually, the day of the Lord that Zechariah 14 is, is moving us toward is, is talked about by Paul in Philippians 2, right? Verses 10, 11, at the name of Jesus, you know this passage, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. We long for that day when every knee will bow, every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord. We have one Lord. We also have one faith. There is one faith. And my understanding of this one faith is it's the central, fundamental Christian doctrines that we believe. Jude talks about this, Brother Jesus, Jude chapter, or verse 3, chapter, verse, whatever, um, only one chapter. Uh, beloved, uh, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, our one faith, our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith, to defend the faith, to protect the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Once for all delivered to the saints. We need to defend that faith, protect that faith. I'll be talking about that more in just a bit. What is that faith rooted in? Well, you could point to a whole lot of different verses in the Bible that, that uh, clarify that. But one of them, John writes about in 1 John 5, verses 11 to 13, he says, and this is the testimony. This is your faith that God has given us, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. John says in Verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That assurance, that security we have, one faith linked together with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you could get the picture of a, of a branch with, 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 uh, with, with a central vine and branches going, going off of it. And every, every branch is united with each other, with other branches, because they're connected together to the what? To the central vine. And we remember that John 15, Christ says, He is the vine. We are the branches. We need to abide in him. Oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah, got that. Moving closer to Christ. Our faith is in Christ alone as revealed in God's word. Amen? Do you believe that, friends? Our faith is in God alone, Christ alone. The name, the only name under heaven by which we can be saved. Based upon the teachings of Scripture... You know what? A little sleep check. If you agree with that statement, stand to your feet right now. Okay? <laughs> ah, okay. Wow, praise God. That, that shows two things, I'm hoping. One, everyone's awake. And, and secondly, look around the, 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 the church here. 
This is our unity in Jesus Christ. This is our one faith here. We share this in common, brothers and sisters. Okay, you can sit back down. And... Yeah. All right, I used to be a youth pastor. We do things like this. All right. So, moving along then. We're, 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 we're moving, okay? Um, one baptism is the next one that Paul lists. One baptism. We're almost there. Baptism. An outward a public demonstration of an inward spiritual activity of faith in Christ by the Spirit of God. That's what baptism is. An outward public demonstration of an inner activity. Our faith in Jesus Christ by God's Spirit. We're not talking here when he says there is one baptism. We're not talking about, about church traditions. Oh, oh I, I believe in, in sprinkling or pouring or, or dunking or whatever it might be at, at certain ages and all this kind of business. No, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is being baptized into Christ. Baptized into Christ. United with him. So Christ's death is our death. Christ's resurrection is our resurrection. That's our unity that we share together. Paul talks about this in Galatians 3. I know there's a lot of different verses we're talking about. You could be writing them down if you want or whatever. Look them up later. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 28. For in Christ Jesus, you all are sons of God. Through faith... Paul says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If we've been baptized into Christ, we've put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There's no male or female. Anything that segregates us is gone. Now we are, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. It's, it's, it's right there. These are not my words, okay? It's the Bible. Last one that he mentions there. Are you still with me? He gets in verse 6. There is one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Our unity is rooted, Paul says, in God's unity, in the Trinitarian unity. He's now said in verse 4 that there's one spirit. Verse 5, there's one Lord Jesus Christ. And now he says in verse 6, there's one God and Father. The Trinity is united. And we remember 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. God, the Father, is over all. He is through all. He is in all. He is, we say the, the term, omnipresent. He is present everywhere. David, Psalm 139, where can I go from your presence? Answer, nowhere. God is everywhere present. He is aware of everything because he's there. He sees it all. He is, th th this is, this is, uh, friends, the, 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 the theological terms are, he is transcendent. He is supreme. He is over everything. At the same time, he is imminent. He is close to us. He is in authority over everything while at the same time being with us. Now, in Ephesians 4, we see that God demonstrates loving unity and has designed the church to demonstrate it. That's his design for the church. It's not tangential. I've, I've listed a, a lot, maybe too many, but I don't know, whatever. Um, a lot of other verses, right? To show that this is, this is the flow of Scripture. This is the heartbeat of God it's not an isolated principle, but I want to look at one final passage. We're going to ask you to flip over in your Bible to John 17. One final passage that brings this point into stark relief. John 17. In John 17, we get a 
brief glimpse into Jesus' passion for our unity. You want to hear Jesus' passion? This, John 17 is incredible. We could have spent a lot of time on this. We're not going to spend a lot of time. It's going to go painfully quickly. But John 17, we're allowed to eavesdrop in, not to a prayer that Jesus teaches to his disciples, but an actual prayer, a conversation that the, the Son of God has with the Father as Jesus shares his heart with his father. It's the longest recorded prayer that we have from Jesus. Shortly before his betrayal, his suffering, his death, Jesus prays first for his and the father's glory, and then he moves into praying for his followers, both those that were with him and those who would come after him. And in the midst of that prayer, John 17, in the midst of it, there's some perspective altering words that Jesus prays, and I'm just going just gonna to draw your attention to a, a few little elements here. The last part of verse 11, do you see it there? Last part of verse 11, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one that they may be one even as we are one. And then dropping down, verses 20 to 23. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's, that's all the way stretching down to us today. That they may, be, may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. Verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may, be, may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Friends, um, these verses, Jesus breaks open and reveals his heart, his passion, his desire, his longing for people in the church to become one. In fact, uh, Larry Osborne said Jesus predicted church growth I will build my church, Jesus says, but he prayed for unity. He prayed for unity. So we see in these verses, and this is going to be really, really quick, we see first of all the pattern, the pattern, the Trinity exemplifies unity in verse 11. The Father and Son are one. Verse 21, the Father is in the Son, the Son in the Father. Jesus again and again saying this, verse 22, the Father and Son are one. Verse 23, Jesus is in us and the Father is in Jesus. The Trinity shows the pattern of unity. We move from the pattern to the plea that Jesus makes the petition. Christians are to be one as the Trinity is one, is Jesus' point here. Christians, Paul prays, may Christians be one, verse 11, verse 21. May they all be one. May they be one, verse 22, verse 23. May they all become perfectly one. His plea, his passion, his desire and longing is for us to be one. And his purpose what is the reason for that? The goal, the, the target, the objective for this unity that Jesus prays for in verse 21, so that, these are Jesus' words, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 22, he prays that the world may witness a display of God's glory. Verse 23, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them. Jesus prays for unity so that the world will experience so that they will experience God's love through Christ. Now track with me in this. The unity of Christ's followers, that's you and me, with God, with each other, thus becomes a global testimony, a witness of the person and work of Jesus Christ. How we relate together communicates 
who Jesus is and what he came to do. That's his prayer there. That's amazing. As Thurston County peeks in at our church, observing how we relate together, friends, are they drawn to our God or are they drawn away from our God and the gospel by what they see, what they hear, what they read through those those online postings, what they witness in us. Drawn to Jesus or away from him. Now, a quick word. I, I, I need to offer this. Just, just by way of balance, unity and truth, we need to understand that unity in the church is, is never at the expense of biblical truth. Amen? Okay, now what I'm talking about here is that we don't sacrifice biblical convictions on the altar of ecumenical fluff, okay? My point is that core biblical truths must be ferociously, uncompromisingly defended. Jesus makes this point, John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth your word is truth we don't compromise in the truth but i fear at times equally ferociously defended are my preferences my likes my comforts my personal perspectives that fall far short of core biblical truths. And what are those core biblical truths? Well, Paul's given us a good list of seven of them, hasn't he? In Ephesians 4, it's a good start. At LCF, we have a, uh, a, a few statements that communicate our core beliefs. We have our statement of faith. We've got our church covenant. We've got our purpose statement. Check this out, our purpose statement. We exist. See if you, if you agree with this. I hope you do. We exist. This is who we are. We exist to worship and glorify God in fellowship with one another by making disciples, by equipping the church, and by reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? I hope you agree with that, friends. That's who we are as a church body. That's why we exist. Next week, we'll explore some of the ways that in this united body, we can embrace diversity in the church and still be unified. But I'll give you a clue for what we're going to be talking about next week. We don't stay unified and and embrace our diversity by chucking gospel truth out the window. That's not what we do. Our unity is a prioritizing of what harmonizes us over what divides us. In Christ, friends, you could think of, we have the same best friend, don't we? I mean, and that that gives us a lot in common with each other. We follow the same Lord. We we study the same book. We, We share similar struggles with each other. We have experienced the same spiritual birth by the same Holy Spirit. And in Jesus Christ, we're all heading to the same destiny. Amen? Amen. Can't wait to get there. I thought about, um, you know, maybe listing some of the practical growth edges for our um, LCF body, some of the ways that maybe we struggle, some of the issues that have separated us. And then I kept praying. I said, Lord, is that wise? And, and I don't know, maybe the Spirit just moved in my heart that said, ah, you better not do that. <laughs> it might actually cause more problems than it could help. And, and you know what? That's what the Apostle Paul does. He doesn't focus on all the divisions. What he focuses on and is, is, is what unifies us. We can do the same thing. Focus on what unifies us together. You know, along these lines, I'll just wrap up by um, a couple last thoughts. Uh, when I was in seminary, this is just me, okay? Um, Eric, Yahoo, random guy that's, that's sharing with you. I was in seminary, and, and I came out of seminary and started pastoring church, and, and um, 
Man, I thought I had it all together. I knew what, right and wrong, black and white. Everything was very, very clear in my mind. You know, seminary kind of does that to you. Hang on, son. You're, you're, you're going to get there soon. Um, but I was, I, it was little toleration, little deviation. It, it was, I was dogmatic. I was, I was opinionated. And, and I led like that. I, I, I regret some of the things that I, a lot of the things. But, uh, in retrospect, what felt like convictions to me were oftentimes things that were really my preferences, my, my leanings from my background, from my personality, my training, these sorts of things. Today, <laughs> a little bit of water under the bridge since that time. It keeps getting more water. I don't know. Um, but today... Hopefully, I haven't gained a bit of wisdom. I realize it is wise and beneficial just to loosen your grip, Eric, on some of those issues that I fought so hard for. There are good viewpoints, friends. There are great perspectives out there that do not originate between my ears. Okay? There are many other good ideas and thoughts out there. Life experience, oftentimes humbling, has a way of growing us in these areas, gaining perspective. Living cross-culturally can help with this. You know, some of you have lived overseas, I, I think. You knew that overseas was going to pop up somehow in, in this message. Um, so uh, you, you've lived overseas. You, you've, maybe you've lived in, in lands, in countries where the, the Christians... Fellow believers, brothers and sisters, were few and far between, and that isolation can be debilitating. I was reading just from the M family, our church partners with them, and, and, um, and they were sharing about that difficulty that they experienced. When I lived uh, for a while in, in Indonesia and, and also in Kazakhstan uh, sometime later, I, I, f I found uh, that, uh, that when I encountered a, a true brother or sister in Jesus Christ, Oh, who cares about their denomination if they love Jesus? It was so sweet. It was, it was like a, um, okay, all right, I'll share my heart a little bit here. It was like homemade blackberry ice cream on a hot summer day, okay? I don't know. I've never had that. I just dream of it, okay? <laughs> And it was so soul rejuvenating, soothing. It was, it, it was just, ah, it was beautiful to find a, a brother or sister in Christ in these lands where there are so few of them. Friends, make no mistake, I absolutely still hold to non-negotiable biblical truths. But much of the rest of, uh, uh, that, that, that really can be personality, driven can be preference driven what feels right to me i can release in favor of striving for unity and love in the body of christ so i want to end in this way i'm going to give you five brief application steps this is going to go so fast you're going to blink and it's going to be gone okay practical ap ac ap action steps for growing in unity first of all you can jot these down if you want pray Pray. Pray for unity. Just pray. Share your heart with God. If you desire to grow in unity, pray for that person who annoys you so much, who, who is quite different than you. Pray for God's heart of love for all people, including that person. Pray. Secondly, memorize. Memorize scripture relating to unity. I've given you a, a whole arsenal of verses to start memorizing. Actually, you could start with Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Start memorizing. Let it fill your heart and your mind. Memorize. Elevate others. Number three, elevate others. Value others above yourself. Man, those easy words are so easy to say, so hard to do. Spend enough time with that person that you can find things that you actually like about them. Elevate others before yourself. Choose unity, number four. Choose unity. I told you, they, they go fast. Choose unity. Focus on what unites us rather than what divides us. So simple, but we can all do that. 
Choose unity. Focus on what unites rather than what divides. And then finally, fifth, speak well. In your words, whether it's verbal or written communication, which all flows from the heart, right? Jesus says, build others up rather than tearing them down. Build others up rather than tearing them down. Pray, memorize, elevate others, choose unity, and speak well. This week, we've been focused on God's design for unity in the church. Next week, God's design for diversity in the church. Continuing on with Ephesians 4, dipping over into 1 Corinthians 12. Brothers and sisters, may we be encouraged and urged to live out our calling to live out our calling by walking with each other in loving unity based on the unity that we see in the Trinity and the unity that God designed in his church. Will you pray with me? Our Father, Lord, these words are so applicable. We thank you for inspiring Paul to communicate this message that we need in the church today. Father, we praise you for the unity that there is in the Trinity. Spirit, Lord Jesus, Father God, perfect model of unity. And our Father, we thank you for the unity that we share in the body of Christ. One body. Lord, thank you for the one hope that we have, for the, the one faith that unites us, the baptism baptized in Christ that, that ties us together as one. And Father, we humbly confess to you and we ask you to forgive us for thoughts, for words, for, for actions that have divided instead of unified. Grant us wisdom, Lord. Grant us wisdom and, and, and courage to release secondary issues as we cling together to primary issues. That grant us the wisdom and courage to, to live out our calling in Christ, to, to share in Christ's passion. Our prayer comes right alongside of his that the world will be drawn to you by what they see in us. And Father, our words join with the Apostle Paul in Romans 15. May you, the God of endurance and encouragement, grant us to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together we may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. To you be the glory now and forevermore. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Amen. Let's stand as we close our service with this wonderful hymn focusing on Jesus Christ as our foundation.
as our benediction, hear these words from 2 Corinthians 13, 11, and 14. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You are dismissed.